Looks like another company got the message about how Wall Street likes businesses that actually make a profit. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me today, our man in Colorado, Motley Fool Senior Analyst, Tim Byers. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Fully caffeinated. Lots of earnings-related things to talk about. You know what else is caffeinated? Salesforce oh shares today up more than 12% because Salesforce beat expectations kind of across the board. I mean, the revenue number sort of stands out to me as, um, and I'm not a shareholder, but I was particularly struck by the revenue number up 14% compared to a year ago. Uh, obviously, Salesforce has been in the news lately because of layoffs, because of the uh, latest co-CEO to leave. It's been a pretty eventful few months for Salesforce. You're a shareholder. How are you feeling, and what stood out in the report? Well, I'm feeling better for a couple of reasons. First, the stock is up materially, so that's great. But I think there's a bit of maybe... Sometimes we call these sorts of things relief rallies, Chris. And I think there's some some real cognitive relief that, oh, okay, great. The revenue was up materially. And I think there is a bit of acknowledgement from management, particularly Mark Benioff, that yes, we have to be better at controlling costs because they have activist investors breathing down their neck. And so you did see that. So for example, in this in this particular quarter, granted, you know there is a you know there's still a lot of cost in the uh, Salesforce business, but I'll just give you a couple of things here. So, cost of revenues for the quarter, 2.1 billion in the current quarter, year ago quarter, 2 billion. So, this is not the spend freely Salesforce that we are used to seeing. Total operating expenses for the quarter, about $5.9 billion. That was up from $5.5 billion. So, yes, material, but not like big jumps the way we're used to seeing it. And I think the thing that really stood out for me, Chris, this is for the quarter on a year-over-year basis, 984 million diluted shares outstanding versus 986 million so down 2 million now there's a lot of accounting that can go into i'm not saying that salesforce is oh boy now they're getting some religion and they're buying back stock and actually reducing their share count there could be some timing in effect here it, they did buy back some shares you know we have to wait to see how much they're actually going to get religion around that but i would say chris a little bit of encouraging signs in terms of expense management as well as a better than expected revenue number. So why is the stock up? It does feel like, hey, maybe we're seeing a slightly more disciplined sales force. That would be a good thing. It would be a good thing. I want to come back to the discipline, but first, since you were talking about the share buybacks, part of the news here is Salesforce doubling their share buyback program that they announced last August from $10 billion to $20 billion. I'm assuming you put that in the uh, positive category. I mean, it should be a positive. Let's say that. Let's say it should be a positive, because it depends on what Salesforce does with its historical practices around equity compensation for employees. They've historically been incredibly generous for employees that they've acquired through acquisitions and employees that they've hired organically. They tend to be very, very generous in this area. So a $20 billion buyback could do a lot to create accretive value to shareholders if it's not wiped out by a whole bunch of equity grants to employees. Now, I think that buyback plan is large enough that it should be accretive to employees, and particularly if the current path that we're seeing continues. So, for example, if just looking at the cash flow statement here from the current quarter, the overall expense that they got the credit on the cash flow statement for stock based compensation expense in the latest quarter was $809 million. That's 
versus $763 million in the year ago quarter. So again, it's not like a huge increase in a lot of stock-based compensation expense. That may have to do as much with how the stock prices come down. And so the value of that expense is a lot lower. So it just sort of evens out and they've still issued a lot of shares. A lot of things remain to be seen, but it does seem as though that 20 billion is going to be put to use on behalf of shareholders. I just, I I think it's very easy to take a look at this. And I, you know, kind of like Chris, you and I are both sports fans. And you know how as sports fans, we take one game and we say, wow, man, what an amazing performance. And we project that out. I think the caution here is let's not take this quarter and project it out and assume everything is amazing for Salesforce. We don't know that yet. We don't, although, in you know, you reference the the belief that we might be dealing with a more disciplined sales force, a more disciplined CEO, Mark Benioff. And one of the bits of information we got that I think is an argument in favor of that is Benioff saying on the conference call that the company disbanded its committee on mergers and acquisitions. I'm Again, I'm not a shareholder, but if I were, I would be happy about that. Yeah. I would. I sort of look at Salesforce and think, no, you're big enough. Make make the stuff that you've acquired, uh, which on balance, I think Salesforce has done a good job with that under Benioff's leadership. But it does seem like a time to, uh, you know, we've seen this from other companies this earnings season, to really focus on basics, really stick to your knitting. I fully agree with that, and I do agree that it, it is good news, Chris. This is one of the areas you're really going to want to watch if you are a Salesforce shareholder. So just looking at the balance sheet, if we look at the balance sheet, there's a line on there called goodwill, and it stayed relatively stable year over year, about $48.6 billion presently versus roughly $48 billion last year. And so really no material changes there. But that is a lot of money, and goodwill is the excess that Salesforce has paid. It's like they've made a lot of acquisitions. When they've paid a premium over and above the intrinsic value of the company they acquired, that premium goes on the balance sheet as goodwill. It's like, this is value we believe we're going to accrue as it becomes part of Salesforce. And so it's recorded as an asset on the balance sheet. A lot of that, Chris, is due to the acquisition of Slack. And so getting their strategy right and actually getting real value, I mean serious value, out of that Slack acquisition, which I don't think we've really seen yet. They ha- That has to happen, because if it doesn't, there's going to be a, a quarter or a year, maybe in the next two years, where they have to test this every year, and finally they have to throw up their hands and admit, like, yeah, you know what? we overpaid for this thing. And then it's a big write-off and the stock gets absolutely crushed. So yeah, they really do need to do this so they avoid the specter of a big goodwill write-off on Slack. And it is, last point on this, it is something they said they were always gonna do. They wanted to make Slack sort of this portal into the rest of Salesforce, like you'd go into Slack, and then you'd issue commands and start conversations and open up a Salesforce app right from within Slack. And you do all of this work together as a group in a Slack channel using a Salesforce product like Quip or something like that. That is still the vision for this. So they do need to focus on that, Chris. There is absolutely no doubt. Let's close on the stock, which is with the rise today basically where it was three years ago at the start of the pandemic. Prior to that, you look at the chart of Salesforce, and it's a pretty steady up and to the right. Uh, It's been a roller coaster since then. Do you look at the underlying business of Salesforce with everything we've just talked about? Do you look at it and say, this is a stronger business than it was three years ago this time? with the stock basically being at the same point? Is it a more challenged business? Is it weaker? Where where is the underlying business relative to the stock? What a great question. I think think it's in transition. 
I don't think you can say it's stronger, and I don't think you can say it's weaker. I will say I think it's more focused, and that is a very, very good sign. A more focused sales force can do a lot of good for shareholders. It can improve its interface. It can improve improve the integration in its apps. And this company has a lot of capital. So if all of that capital that it generates is now focused internally on improving the business, on improving Slack, on making integrations tighter, on improving the user experience, look out. They can be very, very dangerous in their core markets. So that is a good thing. A focused sales force is potentially a dangerous sales force, but I don't think yet you can say it's either stronger or weaker. I just think you can say it's in transition, Chris. Tim Byers, always great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. Just as more companies like Salesforce are sticking to the basics, so are consumers. Jason Moser and Matt Frankel share some thoughts on the decline of the nice-to-have economy. Hey, Matt, it's great to catch up with you again. You know, there was an article by Christopher Mims here several weeks back in the Wall Street Journal that talked about the decline of the nice-to-have economy. And, you know, I thought it was a good and timely piece given where things stand today. Right? We have the pandemic long on the rearview mirror. Things are starting to, to normalize. And at the same time, with all of that, we're seeing challenges in the broader economy as it pertains to the consumer. Uh, I mean, at the end of December, we saw a full 64% of Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. Inflation, of course, is still an issue. And Matt, just frankly, the, the consumer's running out of money. <laughs> uh, let's let's open up with, with this topic. First and foremost, how would you describe the nice-to-have economy? Well, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head with the running out of money thing. So, the the, the nice to have economy—it's always a thing, right? Everyone always wants to, you know, to buy things they want, not just things they need. Um, and that's especially true in uh, periods of economic prosperity. But the past couple of years, twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one in particular, have been unusual in the sense that consumers had a ton of disposable income, more so than in a typical like economic peak. Due to a combination of factors, there were all the, the stimulus measures that were taken. There was uh, postponed payments, like we're still not paying our student loans. Um, that I don't know about you, but that gives me an extra few hundred dollars a month to, of, of spending money. <laughs> well, thankfully, Matt, I don't have any student loan bills coming up. But you know, given your given your uh, your financial advisor status, I, we may need to chat after taping because I have a, a, one child going to college in the fall and another one going a year later. So we're, we're still trying to put all of those pieces together. <laughs> I mean, you you figure the average student loan payments in the three to four hundred dollar ballpark that gives yeah. the average person who with student loans like four thousand dollars of extra money. It's a lot. Uh, and then combine that with the lack of ability to go out and spend money on experiences and things like that in 2020 and 2021, people had a lot of money to spend on stuff they didn't need is, is kind of the best way to describe it. Yep. Yep. You know what it made me think of uh, immediately, and your kids are a little bit younger than mine, so this may be even more fresh in your mind. But as they're going through school at that young age and they're learning about wants versus needs, right? Um, in, in, in that, that's something that we deal with all throughout our lives, right? I mean, we're dealing with sort of that want versus need and, and having to balance that. It's nice to be able to get those things that you want, but you need to make sure to take care of those needs first. And, and it really does feel like this nice to have economy. That's a lot of those wants, isn't it? It is. And I mean, I'm just as guilty as anybody. Like, I mean, I couldn't spend money if I wanted to during 20 and 2021. So what do we do? We put a pool in our backyard. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just as guilty as anybody. But we, it, it, it is really important to different, differentiate wants versus needs. And the fact that needs have gotten so much more expensive in 2022 and so far in 2023, the fact that our needs have gotten so much more expensive, it's not just that people run out of money, but when needs get more expensive, it gets tougher to spend money on the wants. Yep. Yep. It really feels like, you know, we saw an exceptional number of companies pop up over the last uh, several years here that play into this trend. What are some of the what are some of the companies or the markets that really stand out to you as far as the these these nice to haves? 
I mean, there, like, like I said, I already told you about my pool. Uh, but, but there <laughs> that are, sounds like, like a need. I mean, you know, no, but just another one in my house right now. Uh, Peloton. Ah, um, yeah. I mean, Peloton was a big one. They're, they were. They're definitely something that you don't need. There are exercise bikes that are about a tenth of the price of a Peloton. Yeah. Uh, but they're, it's a great product. They're, it was really nice to have. And especially after our gym shut down during COVID, we, we could really justify the cost. We got a Peloton in our house, and we actually saved money, money on our monthly exercise expenses um, because we had our Peloton. I mean, so exercise equipment is one. There's uh, personal styling boxes. You remember Stitch, uh, you know, Stitch Fix is a big example. Oh, yeah. Um, my wife, uh, she couldn't go shopping for her scrub. She's a, an ICU nurse. She couldn't really go shopping in person. So uh, companies like Figs uh, be- became a, a big staple of – I mean, there, I, t- I mentioned it on the show one time. I, I was doing a show and three Figs packages arrived while I was on the show. Wow. Um, I would say even like companies that specialize in discretionary retail, like say Best Buy – like to a lesser degree, because they do sell things that people kind of need, like a washer and a dryer and and things like that. But they do sell a lot of things that people were buying in large quantities, one, because they were working from home, and two, just because they had a lot of extra money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm glad you brought up Best Buy, because it also, you, you look at like a Best Buy, and then you compare that sort of a big retail operation to something like a Target or a Walmart, and while Target and Walmart are certainly full of a lot of those wants, you know they're also businesses that are really capitalizing on the grocery market, and we could argue that uh, groceries certainly are a need. Um, now, it, it, it's interesting. You know, this article's talking, speaking of groceries. I mean, it, it feels like one of the bigger victims here as of late uh, pertains to groceries, right? It's, it's all of these meal kit companies. We've seen so many of these pop up. Um, and, and I, I, like, I understand the convenience, right? Everybody needs to eat. That's the beauty of, of food from that perspective and and investing in a, in a well-run restaurant operation, for example. Um, but it, it, it does seem like we saw a lot of, of the meal kit type businesses really harping on that convenience factor, um, they they're they're starting to suffer a little bit more now, though, aren't they? Yeah, and it's not just the meal kits; it's the the food delivery services as well, like DoorDash and Uber Eats. Yeah, people people didn't realize as much during you know the pandemic shutdowns how inflated prices get when they're they when uh, restaurants list their stuff on DoorDash. They really do. kind of you know, to kind of offset the, their own fees. So that's something that is really starting to suffer too. And the meal kits were. In my opinion, we're just a bad business model from the start. We've used them before. The customer acquisition cost is through the roof. The churn is, I mean, Peloton, for all its faults, its churn is like 1% a month. Yeah. Meal kits, it's like 20 times that. Yeah. I mean, and, and they have to offer things like half price off your next, you know, three orders just to get people to stay. And that's not sustainable. Those companies are losing money left and right. Which was fine when money was free and investors were willing to speculate on companies like that, just growth at all costs, if you will. But now that you know, now that money is not free anymore, now that interest rates do exist, um, you're starting to see investors not tolerate money losing businesses, and there's not a way really for them to gain the customers that they need without losing money. Yeah, and just you know, a side note there. You said the, you said the word sustainable. That just made me think. With these meal kit companies, as convenient as, as it may be for some, and, and I'll I'll be clear. I mean, I, I I do most of the cooking here at home, and I, I never would consider subscribing to one of those meal kits. Partly because I just know how to cook, and I like being able to do it um, as I like to do it. But the, the the waste that comes along with those meal kit companies, I mean. That's something that you ha- you have to keep in mind. I mean, right? We saw as as this as the e commerce has is, is exploded over the last decade. You know, one of the big concerns has always been packaging and the waste that comes along with that. How can we do this so it's it's a bit more uh, sustainable and less impactful uh, on 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 the planet? There, in 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 for all of the work, I'm sure that the meal kit companies have done in that regard. I mean, when you're talking about sending food, that requires a lot of different uh, moving parts, keeping things cool, keeping things dry. That There is just a tremendous amount of waste that really comes with that. Oh, for sure. But, I, I mean, one, one thing the meal kits do have going for them, because we've used them a couple times, is they cut down on food waste. They send you the exact amount of groceries you need, yeah. which is really hard to do, especially for like two adults. Yep. It's, it's tough to buy like uh, just enough produce for two adults. 
uh, you know, without having a lot of waste. Absolutely. But you're right. It, the waste is a big issue. People are really starting to realize that now. People were willing to tolerate it a little bit more during the pandemic when there was – well, during the earlier days of the pandemic. It's still going on, but when there wasn't much of a choice. So it, it's – you know, the, the waste is definitely something that's on consumers' minds and kind of getting them back into the grocery store. So what strikes me about this trend is this this doesn't really seem like a one-off. It seems like something that that pops up um when when like you were saying before consumers have more money to spend. Um and then then when that money starts running out, we see, we see these things start to pull back a little bit. So it it strikes me this is something that's a bit more cyclical in nature. Yeah, discretionary spending is very cyclical. We saw a surge in discretionary spending in like the 2005-2007 time frame before the financial crisis happened, for example. But the 2021, 2020 and 2021 period had that unusual combination of factors, the stimulus, the postponed payments, the inability to go out and spend money that really just made it an unusually high level of discretionary spending. Now, combine that with the, willing, the willingness of investors to pump all their money into these profitless businesses – essentially subsidizing people's discretionary spending. And it was just kind of like a perfect storm for this, um, the need or the, the nice to have economy. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, well, I tell you this, this, one of these things that you, you see is, is you, you use these nice to haves as time goes on, as they become a little bit more of a you find out ways to justify this being a must have right and, and whether it's the convenience factor or whether it's something else entirely uh, you you do start to find ways to justify these being need need to have and and you know i i think it's also important for investors to remember too just on that cyc- cyclical nature of consumer discretionary i mean these are the times probably where you want to start looking at the opportunities in in in, in uh consumer discretionary when when we're seeing more pain when we're seeing these valuations depressed right because it's not something that will last forever it, it's certainly not to say that all of these will come back like meal plan companies for example i'm not sure that's necessarily the market that i'm looking to invest in but perhaps you know fitness perhaps specialty specialty retail something like that i mean these are these are probably the times to look at um look at some of these nice to haves and it makes me wonder for you what is a nice to have that has become a must for you over the past few years well i would say my pool but it's not like i could give that back even if i wanted to <laughs> you're stuck with that one yeah um, something i something that i could get rid of i would i would say my streaming services that's the, i added a um at the start of of the pandemic i had netflix that was it and now i have uh netflix i have hbo max i have disney plus my, my kids would never never let me get rid of Disney Plus now. <laughs> During the, in the early days of the pandemic, it was nice to have. Now I kind of consider that an essential. So and and for my wife, it would be the Peloton because it's that subscription model that kind of like sucks you in. Now that you've already spent thousands of dollars on your equipment, it seems silly to cancel your monthly subscription and just let it sit there. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that would be an essential too. Yeah, and, and I mean the health benefits too of exercise. And I mean, well, I, at least absolutely. I, 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 I like going. Benefits. I like going to the gym, but then again, <laughs> I work from home all day, so I like getting out. Yeah, she works in a hospital all day, so she likes coming home and working out. Yeah, very understandable. Well, let's wrap this up real quick, just with an idea here. Of, uh, you know, in, in in sort of looking at these companies that start out as maybe nice to haves, and then sort of flip to that essential. Some good examples there. What are some characteristics, or what does it take for a company to get from nice to have to essential does it is it something that relies on external forces macroeconomic conditions whatever it may be or are there things that company itself can control to take that to make that leap from being a nice to have to oh now listen we are an essential part of your life and and you need us well i would say what one a network effect um it wasn't that long ago when a smartphone was considered a nice to have luxury um, you think of Apple. A- everyone thinks of Apple as not a, an optional product. A recession hits, they don't sell any fewer iPhones, not significantly. Um, and the, the network effect um, of that of their products definitely helps. And is this, the same thing goes with streaming. Streaming is a superior product and at a superior price point to the alternative, which is kind of the obstacle that companies like Peloton need to overcome. Because, yes, Peloton is absolutely a superior product to the $300 um, exercise bikes. 
but it's not at a similar price point. And so, so it, it, people have re, a really tough time viewing something as a must have that costs 10 times as much as the alternative. And that's why the streaming services, I think, are, are so successful because their, their cost is comparable to the alternative. And it's a, in many ways, a better product. Well, we'll end it there. Matt, thanks so much for making the time for us today. Of course. Always good to be here. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.